let's <clears throat> look here in our, we're in Luke chapter 17, and we'll be starting with verse 11, but let's have a word of prayer first. Father, I pray as we go into the word, I pray that thy Holy Spirit would just speak to each and every heart, uh, not <clears throat> what I've conceived or, <clears throat> excuse me, it's conjured up in my mind, but Lord, what thy Holy Spirit has given to speak, and Lord, I just pray that it be thy spirit that speaks through me and, and does the work that you want accomplished today. Thy Holy Spirit's outreached, outstretched arm, opening the mind and heart to the word God has for them today. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I've heard pastors who were going to move out and plant churches in other states here in America. I've heard missionaries that are going on to foreign fields, and they've made the same statement. And it, the statement, I, I think it's a, something that sounds good, but it just never rested well with me, okay? And, and they said, I am going to build the kingdom of God, and we'd like you to help us to build the kingdom of God. And that just doesn't sit right with me in, in, in a doctrinal way. But um, I, I know their heart is good, and they have that plan in their heart and mind. But have you, in a Bible search, get on the apps, you know, you have Bible apps, and, and, and look on the app and say, uh, just type in for that app uh, to help build the kingdom of God. And I tried it. Didn't find it anywhere. I tried it on a Bible app to type it in and search in our King James Bible and never found it. And so, there's no word that says, help build the kingdom of God. To be frank with you, that reminds me of a man out there, he's got his little boy, maybe he's five years old or something like that, and he's got the little guy with him, and, and he's uh, mowing the yard, he's sitting on a mower, and he's got the boy sitting in his lap, and they're mowing the yard. And then they stop, and they, he gets his big lawn rake out, and he has a little thing for his little guy to do. And so they get out, and they work on it together and uh, that way. And that little one, he's just, boy, he's just excited. He's on that mower, and he's helping. And so that little four-year-old boy, as small as he is, is just really excited about everything. Believe me, boy, they've got me here. And, and then Daddy... A little bit later, after they're done, they put things away. They're in the house, and Mama's in there, and, and maybe a couple others are in there. And he says uh, to, to Mama and the friends, Boy, if I didn't have my little buddy out there today with me, we would have never uh, gotten done. Boy, this thing would, would have been out of control. Boy, it's a good thing he was out there helping me. Now, now we know better, but boy, it sure didn't make that little boy feel good. And, and that dad enjoyed doing that with his son. Uh, but he says, he did a great job. But we really know daddy was the one that guided the mower, and daddy's the one that really did the raking that needed to be done in the right way. And so you see something like that, and I, I found so often in ministry, people will come up and say, Pastor, that was a good thing you did. Oh, Pastor, I don't know how you did that. And I'm wanting to say, I didn't. And, and time after time, you realize what the Lord has done. And, and people who say, well, just praise the Lord, they'll say, oh, now he's trying to be humble. In front, no, no. If a pastor has any kind of sense of if something good has happened, he knows God has done it. And he knows it very well. Uh, but that little boy goes out of there, and he's just happy about it how he helped mow the yard. I, I just kind of wonder about the day where we get to heaven and the rewards are there. We realize how much God did in us and through us. He helped us. But we were willing to be used of God. That was the important thing. I remember from time to time, I heard people uh, say, help us build the kingdom of God. And I, as I said, I just felt so uneasy about it. Why are they saying that? Why, why are they saying that? It's like, if I don't do this, and if we don't band together and do this, there will be no kingdom of God. 
And, and so you just get to thinking on things like that. And we want to say, I'm helping to build the kingdom of God. Well, let's look at verse 11. And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And he entered into a certain village there, and there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off, because that's what they were supposed to do in that day. They could have got killed if they got too close. And verse 13 says, And, and they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. That is, they were cleansed of their leprosy. They were cleansed. In verse 15 he says, And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. You see, we had those people that perhaps have been in a hospital and they're just wanting to be healed. And oh, if God would just heal me, I would do this. I'll be in church. I, I, look, look, I have led people to the Lord in the hospital. I've gone to visit people in the hospital bed that just, I would got called up and asked to come. And people I didn't know. And they would say, got saved and all that. And some of them were Christians but hadn't been in church in a long time to say, well, God heals you. You're going to be back in God's house. Oh, boy, I'm going to be right there. And you know what? Most time they came one time. They were right there once. And then they don't show up again. See, they wanted God's help. But when they felt like they were all right, they really didn't want anything to do with God. And you have a picture of that right here in this text. Here's the one man giving thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Now there's another problem. The Jews of that day hated the Samaritans. It was kind of like the Samaritans didn't like the Jews. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans. They looked down on the Samaritans of that day as Samaritans would look down on some of the Jews of that day. Neither Jews nor Christians, now keep, I want you to get this down, neither Jews nor Christians are born saved. Because you were born into a Christian family, because you were born a Jew, you were not born saved. No one is saved until they receive the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior through repentance and faith. In Old Testament days, people were saved by faith and repentance. Repentance and faith in the Messiah that would come. In other words, they believed the Word of God. They believed that a Messiah would come. They believed that a Messiah would give His life for their souls and to save them. But they had to receive Him as their Lord and Savior. Even though, at that point, all they knew was the name Messiah. They did not know Jesus. Later, the name the Christ would be like unto the name Messiah. And so they would say they received him and they would be looking for that coming Jesus. When, when the uh, wise men came from the east, they were looking for Jesus. Where is he that is born the king of the Jews? And as they were looking, Herod 
said, where is he to be born? They said in Bethlehem. Is it interesting? People from a far away, the far east, were looking for him. And the people in Jerusalem who are supposed to be expecting a Savior were not looking. Even the religious leaders, the, the priests, they could tell you where Jesus was going to be born, but they weren't expecting it to happen. We believe that Jesus is coming again. But the question we need to ask ourselves, is my life right at this moment the way I want it to be when Jesus comes? Am I separated from sin? Am I separated unto God? Am I faithful unto my Lord? Am I in God's Word? Am I living by the Word of God? See, it's easy to look down on those old priests back in the day that Christ was born. But really, we may not be any better. Because our faithfulness does not show in our lives. And some have things in their lives right now, things that shouldn't be in your life. You know it shouldn't be in your life. You now, somebody confronted you with you to argue about it. But you know down deep it's wrong. And what I'm saying is, is that if we really believe in a coming Jesus Christ could come at any moment, at any moment we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Have you received Him? Jesus, the Messiah, have you received Him by faith believing that He has come and that He did die for every sin you ever have or ever will commit? He already paid that penalty. And he rose bodily from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And Jesus still lives. And by the way, when we are raptured, the Bible says that we'll be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be like him. We'll have a body, Philippians tells us that is fashioned like into His glorious body. You know that tells me something? Not only will this body be changed, but it tells me something else. Jesus Christ told us God is a Spirit. We're told about the Godhead in the Bible. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three were spirits. A Spirit. Three divine persons in one divine essence. And they made the decisions about creating the heavens and the earth. Jesus, a spirit. And yet, throughout all eternity now, even though He's risen from the dead, we'll have a fashion, body fashioned like in His glorious body. Do you realize as God, a spirit, the Bible says He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. As a spirit, He was part of the Trinity speaking these worlds into existence. This earth, this universe, He was speaking it into existence. But yet in His love for us, He would maintain a human body throughout the rest of eternity. Risen, Yes. Oh, there is no power that's going to change his body and wreck it like our bodies get wrecked up with age. We'll have a body fashioned like that glorious body. He didn't have to do that. But he did that because he loves us. He loves us. So he rose from the dead because he wanted us to be saved. He wants you to be saved. Anybody walking on the face of this earth, he still wants them to get saved. You know, we don't like it when we hear of the stories, just like we had on, uh, back on the October 7th of, of those uh, Muslims going in and slaying uh, people in their house and doing it on uh, uh, the videos thing, putting it on the Facebooks and on those people's Facebooks, showing them getting their head cuts off, cut off and all the other things they did with the little children and everything else. Showing all of that. Yes, that should make, that should stir all of us up. But do you realize that any of those souls can still be saved if they're alive? Now that's hard to imagine. 
But you don't know the power and love of Jesus Christ. I don't know how Rahab could be a harlot. And yet, God so changed her life that she is part of the line through which Christ would come. Oh, what a Savior is this Jesus of mine. And you see, all people of all races still need to get saved, and it's always the same way. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There is no other way of salvation. The Catholic Church is not going to save you. The Baptist Church doesn't save you. The, no religion out there is going to save you. It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone that saves. In, in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man, anyone, any one of us, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. That is, you're a brand new creation. He's done something in cleansing your soul, cleansing you of sin, giving you a new nature, giving you the Holy Spirit to indwell you when you receive Him as your Lord and Savior. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things, all that sin, all that filth, all those evil things, all those terrible memories, old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. Now, you'll see throughout the Bible, and I think it's, it's not so much as a reminder. But throughout the Bible, you'll see men, and they'll even refer to it. Apostle Paul said those things that meant so much to him. He had position. He's the one that could, yeah, put them to death. Put those Christians to death. He could say that, and it would be legal. He had power to go and round up these people that were converting to Christ and take them off and put them in prison, if not kill them. He had them beaten. He had them drugged through the rocks, cast into prisons. And God changed his life. And I wonder if he just went back to show his hatred of that sin to do the good things that he did for other people because it seems like at first when you read the Bible that when he would be going into these new places to evangelize they were scared to death of him. But they were convinced in time that he was the real deal. He'd gotten saved. He'd gotten saved like they'd gotten saved. It's not wrong to go back and just show your stand against the sin that you had in your past. You say, well, that reminds me of my past. If it reminds you of your past, remember, it should also remind you of the victory, of the salvation, of the cleansing, and of the new life in Christ. Oh, yes, it's good to remember what God has done for you. Yes, old things were passed away, but the rest of that verse says, Behold. Boy, I like the way that says, Behold, all things are become new. Many times, people have a hard time believing that some people get saved. I wonder how many believers around the cross believed it when Jesus said to that thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. When that, pre when that thief called upon him, When you enter, remember me. In other words, take me with you. He who at that moment on the cross was giving his life to Jesus Christ. A murderer was the apostle Paul 
a lady who had had five husbands, and the man that she was not that she was living with was not her husband. And many Christians down the line who say they believe in the saving and changing power of God. Yet when God does save one, so many people don't want to believe it. They want to believe it. Some get saved and they want to treat them as if they were carrying bubonic plague and get as far from as possible. And my friend, if you're one that sees somebody that has a bad past, and they said they got saved, and boy, you're just going around telling everybody about that person's bad past. Their past is not as evil as what you're doing right there. You're just low down and evil to do that. Because you don't believe that God saved them. And so what you are doing is saying, God doesn't have the power to save that soul. Well, I didn't say that. Yeah, but your actions with your gossip and everything else is saying that. Listen, rejoice if the worst sinner in Ocala gets saved. Rejoice. Don't rejoice over the sins. Rejoice over the deliverance from sin. Oh, yes. We could have people come up and give testimonies of a former life. But sometimes people get up and start giving their testimony, and it's almost like a bragging se session of their testimony. They're almost proud of it. No, when you truly get saved, you're not proud of the past. Many Christians would not want that woman that had five husbands and the man that she was living with was not her husband. They wouldn't want him in their church. But hey, that woman got saved. That woman got saved. And when men started to complain about it, Jesus just stooped over and started writing in the ground. Because one, there had been another woman that got caught in the act of adultery. Have you ever wondered why the Bible says that she got caught in the act of adultery and they were going to stone her? And they tried to put Jesus on, the, uh, on that position of, boy, we got him now, you know. We're going to really be able to put to him now. Said, uh, should we stone her? And Jesus started writing on the ground. I wonder if he started writing their names before he started writing. Because that place cleared out. Those guys didn't stick around. But really the thing I wonder about more, where was the man? I mean, there were two involved, not just the lady by herself. It was a man and a woman. Where was he? Why aren't they stoning him? People were using sin to try to trip up Jesus. And you'll never trip up Jesus. And it worked against them. An attitude like that in a Christian is an attitude that will keep churches and this country from having a revival. The revival that's desperately needed in America cannot happen as long as there are Christians with that heart and attitude. No, we don't endorse sin. But we do endorse the fact that Jesus Christ can save from sin. Here, we found out these lepers were cleansed. They just weren't cleansed of leprosy. They're cleansed of sin. The Lord is forgiving this man. He's wondering what's going on with the rest of these guys. And so, uh, people, when they're vain talking, don't want anything to do because that person has a bad past. And yet, their words that they've used themselves would make any unsaved person blush in certain situations. In verse 18, Jesus said, they're not found that return to give glory 
to God, save this stranger. Where are the other ones? He's looking around. Jesus answered and said, were there not nine or were there not ten? Cleansed? Cleansed. There were ten cleansed. He said, were there not ten cleansed? He's looking for them. Where are the nine? How many had prayer for them, maybe throughout the time, and when it happens, they don't, they don't respond. Look, God has saved your soul. Be faithful to Him. He's cleansed you. Be faithful to Him. The worst thing is to be saved and cleansed of your sin. God has forgiven you. He is using you. And then to wonder, well, I don't feel like going to church tonight. I don't like, feel like going to church on Wednesday. I don't feel like going to Sunday school. I don't want to get that early. And, and I don't want to do this. I don't want Look, the churches of America need revival. And when you look at this country and you see the wokeness, you see, oh, even our president this week now wants to make uh, legalize uh, uh, marijuana so the kids can have it. He wants to change the laws they just made about abortion, give them a free abortion, things like that. And I'm not making this a political thing. What I'm trying to say is that America needs revival. And if the people of God in the churches will quit deciding they got to be a rock and roll concert and decide they need to get the gospel and save this country out, then, then we'll see a change. But Christians have to separate from sin, separate from the world, but not separate from the world that you don't communicate the gospel. You've got to communicate the gospel to the world, and you've got to have a standard that's above uh, the standards of the world, and is the standard of the Word of God, and live by it. That begins to look at the kingdom of God, which I want to really, in the next well, it won't be the next couple of weeks because we've got speakers coming in. But over the next few times, I want to start talking about the kingdom of God. There's so many thoughts out there about the kingdom of God. I'll go into some of it tonight. Not a lot, but I'll go into some of it tonight about the kingdom of God. A lot of things that are just said that aren't true. A lot of things that are said are conjured up in the mind says, well, I really think this, I think that. And the thinking has no biblical basis. So we want to look at the scriptures. I want the people of God that are here to know the kingdom of God. But I also want us to know our duty now. Our duty now. Not looking off in some future. I'm talking about our duty now our duty now. Don't ever get to the point where a drunkard, a harlot, a drug addict, a murderer, a thief gets saved and you won't believe it. You don't want them to be in church. You don't want them to get their lives straightened out because you don't like what they did. Look, those souls need to get saved. God loves them if you don't. But how can you set, you know the word godly means godlike? Christian is Christ-like. How can you be godly and a Christian and not want souls to get saved? The worst of sinners, He can save them. He can change their lives. And He's got you here to help those people when they get saved to get on the right, remember the Great Commission says not just to get them saved. No. It says to teach them to observe all things which He has commanded us. And He allows us as Christians to help in that ministry. Do you want revival in America? Or do you want America to keep going down this road of drugs, murder, perversion? Or do you want to stand up on the side of Jesus? Each of us have to make that decision that are saved. If you're not sure if you die today that heaven's your home, my friend, let me tell you that this. 
Jesus will save you before you leave this auditorium if you'll come to him. If you believe that he died on the cross, and the Bible, not only the Bible, that story's been told for years. He died on the cross for your sins. Every sin you ever have or ever will commit for that matter. He was buried. He rose from the dead, bodily from the dead, victorious over hell and the grave. And he just said, if you come to him in John chapter 6, verse 36, he will in no wise cast you out. No wise cast you out. But you do need to come. Let's bow our heads, please.